Okay, a very good afternoon um, to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on this very hot and sunny afternoon in London. I think it's actually the hottest day of the year, so hopefully we will survive until the end of this. So hopefully we've all got cool drinks as we're going, so we can you can hopefully sit back and relax and enjoy um, the fantastic lineup of speakers that we have for you this afternoon. So uh, for Refugee Week, um, this seminar will focus on family reunion post Dublin 3. So what are the implications for family reunions following the end of Dublin 3 uh, after the uh, result of Brexit? Um, Garden Court Chambers is very uh, pleased to hold this event in conjunction with RLS. Um, what I intend to do is kind of explain a little bit about um, the refugee uh, legal support and also set out what the kind of um, uh, timetable or setup will be for this afternoon. So the speakers and what they will be addressing you on. So uh, RLS, who are RLS? RLS is based and managed by trustees who are located in the UK. They work in solidarity with people who migrate. They advance safe migration through legal support, casework, strategic litigation, outreach, training and partnerships. They advocate and uh, they advocate for the promotion and protection of people's rights uh, throughout the migration process. Um, they work set up with funding in 2017, which was initially provided by ILPA, uh, and they continue to support, to have support of the UK Immigration Legal Centre. Um, all current funding for RLS activities are raised within the UK, both in Athens and the UK. Uh, lawyers and other, volunteer, and other volunteers provide services to RLS and um, are predominantly UK residents. And there's more information about them uh, uh, online and will be included in the slides which will be circulated after the session this evening. So to give you an overview of the webinar and what to expect, you'll have some slides hopefully which will uh, appear before you, or they are there right now. So the first point, the current family reunion provisions inside the rules following the end of Dublin 3 and the potential arguments to make outside of the rules will be dealt with by our, our very own Rebecca Chapman. Rebecca practices in all aspects of immigration, asylum and admin law. She's a trustee of RLS and she has particular expertise in cases that involve vulnerable women, uh, children and political asylum claims. She represents clients at all levels from the first tier tribunal right up to the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights. She sits as a deputy judge in the upper tribunal, Immigration and Asylum Chamber, and I'm very proud to say that she was my supervisor. So she will be doing uh, section uh, A of the seminar. Um, B, the situation on the ground in Lesbos will be dealt with by Nadia O'Mara, who is the Lesbos co coordinator for RLS. She, is, uh, she focuses on the family reunion applications to the UK and facilitates referrals between Lesbos and the RLS clinic in Athens. She also works at the legal centre in Lesbos, providing legal support throughout the Greek asylum procedure, uh, including asylum interview preparation, first instance appeals and subsequent applications. Um, she has a history of working um, on policy and com campaigns in the UK, um, and she will be commencing pupillage at Garden Court uh, uh, later on in the year, so we're looking forward to having her. Um, so kind of in a good position to deal with uh, point B, which is the situation on the ground. Um, see the situation and conditions for asylum seekers in, in Athens and the transition cases following the end of Dublin 3 uh, and those regulations will be dealt with uh, by Lucy Alper. She is the, le the uh, legal support coordinator in Athens. She's been the project coordinator, sorry, on the ground in Athens since November 2019. She coordinates the Athens Law Clinic as well as undertaking legal work uh, herself. Lucy also shares information as part of her work with RLS, creating legal resources, conducting outreach uh, sessions and providing training to other groups in the sector. Uh, Lucy is a qualified member of the Law Society's Immigration Asylum Accreditation Scheme um, and she's worked as a caseworker in this field since 2013, so she has a good breadth of experience. 
Um, point C, the situation and conditions for asylum seekers um, in Athens, uh, sorry, D, will be dealt with by um, uh, Harry Harris and Effie um, Staffordpool. And uh, Harry is a supervisor in the family reunion from Europe um, of as a part of RLS, she's worked in the field of human rights and state accountability since 2015. Before she joined RLS to supervise uh, the family reunion from Europe uh, casework, she worked at Feynman's and was at SOAS. Um, originally from the UK, she's been based in Athens since 2019 and provides legal support for asylum seekers and will be completing the BPTC in uh, or has completed the BPTC. She's going to be starting pupillage with us also in October 2022. It seems like this is an advert um, for pupils to come to Garden Court, and I promise it's not, but maybe it's just a place to be. Um, Effie, um, Effie Stathaplou, um, is also part of the family reunion team from Europe for RLS. She holds an LLB from Athens Law School and is passionate about human rights and refugee protection. She's worked with RLS in Athens and is now based in London, coordinating the Family Reunion from Europe project. Before she joined RLS earlier this year, she worked as a researcher for the Centre for European and Constitutional Law in Athens, um, uh, doing research on legal policy around anti-discrimination and fundamental rights. So um, Harry and Effie will be dealing with that final point, so family reunion from the Europe project. There will be an opportunity this afternoon for questions. Please use the Q&A uh, function. Um, it is at the bottom of your screen on the far uh, right, and it's the bit with speech bubbles. If you write stuff in the chat, we will obviously look at that, but it would be better if you could put it in the Q&A and you can remain anonymous if you would like to. So please do use that if a question pops into your mind. Um, general housekeeping, um, we will stay muted when we're not going to speak. Um, yeah, and think about your questions before we start. Um, and so that's it from me. Um, and I am very pleased to hand over to Rebecca Chapman. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Uber. Uber is in the middle of a very important country guidance case at the moment, so I am going to release her from her obligations because uh, she's back in the tribunal tomorrow. But thank you so much. So I'm going to start really by really the, the historical position. So whilst Dublin 3 regulation is still good law, it is no longer law in the UK since the 31st of December 2020 as a consequence of Brexit. So this slide really just sets out the primary provisions in Dublin. And this is what all European countries and certainly uh, the UK was relying on um, in addition to the UK's own family reunion provisions contained in the immigration rules. And as I will make clear, it is much wider uh, than what, it's, what we now have and has the removal of Dublin in, in terms of our ability to rely on it has caused major difficulties for families that want to reunite in the UK. I think in particular, it's worth highlighting, um, firstly, just the generalized Article 8 uh, point which was that a minor could join a family member. So as long as it was in their best interest. So this permitted, for example, nephews and nieces to join aunts and uncles, and not, it's not just child parent. Um, it also, Article 9, as an adult, you could join your spouse and children if, if they're a refugee. And Article 10, you could join an asylum seeking family member. This is crucial because one of the points that uh, will become clear is that now uh, the sponsor, ideally, according to the rules, cannot be an asylum seeker. And given the substantial delays that we're experiencing uh, as a result of COVID and home office, perhaps, uh, dare I say it, incompetence, um, this is going to cause huge delays in reuniting family members. Also worth noting article 17, 
which was a discretionary clause based on humanitarian grounds. So effectively, so long as there's a family relationship, you could seek to rely on Article 17 if you can show humanitarian grounds and a link between the family member in Greece and the family member in the UK. So these are the statistics in relation to Dublin. So you'll see for the seven years, really almost up to the end of last year, Greece made over 28,000 requests under Dublin III to the EU as a whole. The UK received just over 3,000 of these, so 11%. And over that time period, almost 2,000 people were transferred to the UK under the provisions of Dublin. So last year, according to the Home Office statistics, um, we received, the UK received a number of take charge requests, 1,531, and a very large number of these were from Greece, 74%. And obviously, again, Greece can no longer ask the UK to take charge of family members, uh, nor, however, can the UK send a request that any other European country take back individuals who are in the UK who they say should have claimed asylum previously. We're not, of course, dealing with that aspect today, but just for the record. So uh, moving on to what, what we're left with, um, the Home Office have given indications that they may amend, expand the rules or guidance. Um, those so far are empty forms of assurance as there's no positive indication that they're actually going to do that. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the trustees decided to set up the project which you'll hear about from Harry and Effie which is the family reunion from Europe, in order to explore what impact the withdrawal of Dublin has made on family reunion, and really to show that the, the loss of Dublin is, is having a negative impact on family members. So what we have, which I think is fairly well known because we've had it for some time, is the right to family reunion with a partner or spouse if you are a refugee or have humanitarian protection, and if your relationship predated your flight from your country of origin. So whilst the rules now cover um, a civil partnership or a relationship akin to marriage, which has subsisted more than two years, it has, has to have been in uh, the country of origin, the country of former habitual residents. Uh, next slide, please, Effie. Also, the, there are provisions relating to children, 352D and FG. So you can um, apply uh, as a child in order to join your parents. So the, um, the positives is that if, you, if you're a refugee or who have have humanitarian protection, you're eligible to sponsor your partner, your spouse, or your dependent minor children under the age of 18. You don't need to show that you have adequate maintenance and accommodation. You don't have to meet the Appendix FM threshold, and you can be in receipt of public funds. The negatives, however, are quite substantial. Firstly, unlike under Dublin, you cannot sponsor someone if you are an asylum seeker. So even if you are from Syria, and it's obviously extremely likely that your case will succeed, you can't technically make an application under the rules. Uh, as indicated earlier, you can't, under the rules, sponsor a spouse or partner from a relationship that formed after you fled your country of origin or former habitual residents. You can't sponsor a fiance or a dependent child over the 18 or other adult dependent relatives. You used to be able to support other adult dependent, dependent relatives. That was removed uh, after the July 2012 changes. If you, this is if you're a refugee. And you can't support other child relatives under the rules. 
So that means that, and this is the one remaining category, which is really 297 for refugees. So um, it exists, but it's, it's quite onerous considerations. So the vast majority of applications are going to have to be made outside the rules. And those are obviously going to be based on Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. As we know, Article 8 is about family and private life. Clearly, it's the family life aspect with which we're going to be concerned here. This can be inherently problematic because families sometimes will have been separated for some time uh, through war persecution. So that's, that's really um, got to be the family life that exists between the different family members needs to be evidenced as much as is possible. There are, I've made reference here to a couple. So the Home Office guidance on leave outside the rules, it's not directly relevant, but it is, I think, worth when you're making an application or representations, at least bearing in mind bits of other um, policy guidance that can potentially be utilized. So for example, the EU Family Reunion Directive even though we're no longer technically bound by that, and any other immigration rules and policy that might be helpful. I think what's worth flagging, and there is ongoing jurisprudence about this, is the fact that as a, as a refugee child, you cannot apply to bring your parent. That is subject to challenge at the moment. Um, and obviously it's hoped that that may at some stage change. So, just some thoughts about how to draft applications. In particular, try and pin it to a rule if you can. Try and really boost the Article 8 family life uh, facts and evidence as best you can. And of course, often there will be a, a child or a young person involved. So emphasize best interests, section 55, the guidance and the jurisprudence. So I'm not going to go through case law. This is really just cases that may potentially be relevant, but the slides are going to be uh, sent round afterwards anyway, so you'll have those. The Home Office, when an application's made, suggest that they will make a decision within 90 days, three months. But again, in current in the current circumstances that it may be longer. If an application is successful, the applicant will be given a short-term visa uh, during which time he or she needs to enter the UK. There is a right of appeal if it can be established because one can foresee that the way that the Home Office are going to deal with a lot of these cases is to say that it's not engaged at all. So that needs to be borne in mind when um, we're making applications. So that is all I want to say for now. I am now going to hand you over to Nadia, who is going to talk about the situation on the ground in Lesbos. Um, it's a little wider than just family reunion. One, because obviously what's happening there is interesting. And two, because of uh, COVID, the number of arrivals recently to, to Lesbos has obviously been reduced. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and thanks to Garden Court for hosting RLS um, for this event. As Rebecca just pointed out, um, while my colleagues Lucy, Effie and Harry will be speaking in more detail specifically about um, Dublin transition cases and family reunion applications under the immigration rules post-Brexit. Um, I'll be using my time to speak more broadly to provide an overview of the situation on Lesbos, um, particularly with respect to the applicable asylum procedure and living conditions, um, really in order to highlight the ongoing necessity of, of safe and legal routes to family reunion from Greece and elsewhere um, now that the UK has, has left the EU. Um, so turning then to the, the context on Lesbos and the Eastern Aegean Islands more generally, 
Lesbos and specifically the now destroyed Moria camp has long been a poster child for the failures of EU migration policies and the so-called refugee crisis in Europe. Since, since 2016, the context on Lesbos has been shaped by the EU-Turkey statement, um, which has really transformed Lesbos and also the other um, Aegean islands into essentially open prisons. For those who are not aware, the 2016 EU-Turkey deal is based on a statement of cooperation, um, providing for the return of all irregular migrants arriving on the Greek islands back to Turkey. And the, the root of this deal is, is based on really the flawed designation of Turkey as a safe third country. Um, the safe third country concept, of course, allows um, EU member states to return applicants for asylum or humanitarian protection to a country other than their country of origin um, if they pass through it on their journey to the member state and if they have a connection to that country. Um, it's only permissible um, technically uh, to apply the safe third country concept where that country in this case Turkey satisfies um, a set of criteria. Uh, firstly it must be possible to request refugee status and if eligible receive protection in accordance with the refugee convention and there must be no risk of return to an unsafe country of origin and no risk of serious harm and finally no, no threat to life or liberty on account of any of the five convention reasons. Uh, Turkey, however, and it's well documented, is, is not safe on, on any of these levels. Uh, up until very recently, what has been seen is that it is really Syrian applicants for international protection who, who receive the brunt of the EU-Turkey deal on, on the islands, as their claims for, um, uh, for asylum are subject to admissibility stage, under which it's assessed whether or not Turkey is a safe country for them. What this means in practice is that essentially all Syrians are rejected outright on the basis that Turkey is safe for them. Um, the overwhelming majority of Syrians on the island indeed never have the eligibility of their claims for international protection examined substantively and are at constant risk of deportation. Uh, rejections on admissibility tend to be a copy-paste exercise, and it's very common for Syrians who have been, for example, pushed back from Turkey to Syria, detained in terrible conditions for up to a year, exploited, subjected to violence, um, any of these things in Turkey to be rejected really without any engagement um, with their personal circumstances. Um, this is particularly jarring, given that on the Greek mainland, uh, Syrians tend to have an over 90% acceptance rate on, on eligibility. Uh, the experience for Syrians on the islands to date uh, really highlights how flawed the EU-Turkey deal is. Um, but unfortunately, as, as of last week, things are now likely to become much worse for other nationalities. Um, so the Greek uh, government announced last week that this admissibility component uh, would now apply to applicants from Syria, but also from Afghanistan, Somalia, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And this admissibility stage will now not only apply on the Greek islands, but across Greece, um, including the mainland. What we've seen so far is that this announcement was implemented straight away and um, applicants from uh, the new countries on the list are already only being asked about, um, about Turkey during their personal asylum interviews. The reality of, of this new announcement, if, it, if the ministerial decision remains in place, is that the overwhelming majority of applicants in Greece will be rejected outright uh, without their eligibility for international protection ever being examined. On Lesbos and on the other islands, the EU-Turkey deal has, has impacts which go beyond this safe third, con safe third country concept. Excuse me. Um, as a result of, of the deal, applicants for international protection here are also subject to an expedited asylum procedure uh, known as the border procedure, which has minimal procedural safeguards and there are well-documented flaws in the decision-making process. As well as this, uh, asylum seekers on, on Lesbos and, and the other islands are subject to geographical restrictions on their movement, which means that they are not permitted to leave the islands without special permission. And this is often denied even in cases of extreme vulnerability and where medical um, urgent medical treatment is required and that treatment is not available on the islands. Um, so overall, the reality of the EU-Turkey deal on the islands is that asylum seekers are essentially trapped in an open air prison with, with many people. And what we have seen um, in past years, it's particularly Syrians who are affected by this, trapped in a cycle of repeat application and repeat rejection with, with no prospects of having the substance of their asylum claims ever examined. Could I have the next slide, Effie? Thank you. 
Um, turning then to the, the living conditions for migrants on, on Lesbos and, and by analogy, the other islands. Um, as I've already mentioned, Moria camp served really as the poster child for the terrible conditions in the camps um, in Greece uh, over past years. It was defined by severe overcrowding and at, at some points the population of the camp reached over 20,000 people while the capacity was somewhere in around 6,000. The hygiene conditions were abysmal with limited wash facilities. People routinely had to queue for hours for food distribution, insufficient access to medical and other services. Um, of course, the electricity supply was um, well known as being quite sporadic and dangerous. And um, of course, on the night of 8th of September last year, a really enormous fire broke out uh, at Moria, which completely destroyed the camp. In the following weeks, the, the residents of the camp were essentially left homeless on, on the streets outside the now destroyed camp, um, sleeping without enough um, access to food, water or, or blankets. Um, since then, rather than recognising and remedying the problems of, of Moria, the Greek authorities instead um, hastily created a new temporary camp in an abandoned firing range uh, right beside the sea. Uh, earlier this year, Human Rights Watch um, published a report uh, evidencing um, lead contamination in that camp, which, which the Greek state has, has subsequently admitted is present in soil samples. Uh, lead, of course, is a, a heavy metal, which is highly toxic to humans when ingested or inhaled. And, and this is particularly dangerous for, for children and, and um, people going through pregnancy. Uh, the living conditions in, in this new camper is better, if not worse, than, than Moria. Uh, from months uh, late autumn last year, there were no functioning showers whatsoever in the camp and people had the, um, their only way of, of, of washing was by, by using the, the, um, the sea. Despite the harsh weather conditions, the tents were, were not prepared for, the, for winter and um, given the camp's um, location, it was completely exposed to the elements um, and there was really terrible flooding. Tents collapsed, were blown over and, and were constantly filled with, with water and mud. And now that temperatures are rising in, in the summer, conditions have not really improved. The high temperatures mean that um, tents are unbearably hot, full of insects, very little ventilation and really widespread and severe um, scabies and, and other communicable disease outbreaks. Um, all of what I have just described took place during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it really is a, a miracle that there has not been a major outbreak of the virus in, in the camp. But nevertheless, the measures that were put in place um, to prevent the spread of COVID uh, were and continue to be grossly inadequate, with physical distancing being impossible given the overcrowding. Um, and at the same time, the public health restrictions that, that have been applied um, to residents of the camp have been applied really in a very discriminatory fashion. For example, at, at present, um, I, as, as a resident of, of Lesmos, more broadly have a curfew of 1.30 a.m., um, whereas residents of the camp have, have to be back inside by 5 p.m. And despite claims that the camp is temporary, the Greek authorities have, have signed a, a five-year contract for the premises, um, while at the same time, and somewhat contradictorily, announcements have been made for, for the construction of a new controlled camp on the island. Uh, it remains to be seen whether this will go ahead, but, but the plan as it stands is that residents um, in this controlled environment would have their movement in and out of the camp fully restricted, and it will be located in a, in a very remote uh, part of the island away from um, all urban areas and amenities. Right, the next slide. Thank you. Um, a final issue which, which has really shaped the reality on the ground in Lesbos and, and the other islands is the sharp increase in illegal pushbacks and collective expulsions by the Greek Coast Guard to Turkey. Uh, so over the years, but particularly since 2019 through 2020 and into this year, there have been consistent reports of unlawful return, um, including through pushbacks of groups and individuals from Greece to Turkey um, by Greek law, law enforcement officers and, and also by unidentified masked men. Reports from 2020 recorded multiple incidents in which um, Greek Coast Guard personnel, sometimes accompanied by armed masked men in dark clothing, um, unlawfully abandoned migrants, um, including those who, who had reached Greek territory. Um, migrants have, have been um, routinely abandoned at sea on inflatable vessels without motors. As you can see in the image on the slide currently, they're essentially like floating tents that are, that are just left um, in the middle of the sea. 
these boats are then towed into Turkish waters um, and at that point have been intercepted, attacked and damaged. Um, these collective expulsions have also been ev evidenced and recorded at the Everest land border with, with Turkey and um, in northern Greece. I have the next slide. Uh, of course, collective expulsions are in clear violation of the principle of non refoulement, um, which is present both in Greek national law uh, under the European Convention and, and international law. However, what has been seen is that these systemic violations have, have been met with consistent denial on the part of the Greek authorities and with the complicity of Frontex and the EU. Um, the impact of these pushbacks, even though it was taking place at the same time as COVID, which will, of course, um, reduce movement. Um, but nevertheless, there's been really a startling decrease in the number of arrivals on, on Lesbos and, and the other islands. Um, so new arrivals dropped from 74,000 in 2019 to just over 15,000 in, in 2020. Could I have the final slide? Um, and so finally, what does this all mean for family reunion in the UK? I know I haven't really even mentioned it once so far in my presentation. Um, but while there has been a marked decrease in new arrivals to Greece, the situation on the islands and in the country more generally remains dire and really seems to get worse with every month that passes. And this obviously also applies to, to those um, applicants for uh, international protection and, and migrants more broadly in, in Greece who, who have family in the UK as will be set out um, in more detail in, in the rest of the presentations. Um, the loss of the Dublin route has, has more or less closed the door to one of the only safe and legal routes to family reunion in the UK. And what you can really see um, from what I have just described, that also may be kind of closing the door to people actually having access um, to international protection in and of itself, um, given the limitations currently um, operating in Greece. And so really to conclude without an improved and uh, legal framework and, and the requirement of specialist legal assistance, uh, those with family in the UK will continue to remain trapped on the Greek islands uh, with limited prospects of, of accessing the international protection uh, for which they're eligible or, or to be reunited with, with family in the UK. Uh, that's everything from me and I'll now hand over to Lucy. I look forward to answering questions later. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, Lucy Alpa is now going to talk about the situation and conditions for asylum seekers in Athens and also about transition cases. So these are people who applied for family reunion before the end of Dublin III regulation, whose cases are still um, more or less, there are possibly not many left, but have been processed uh, since um, since Dublin came to an end. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, okay, so I will speak uh, quite briefly about the situation on the mainland. Um, of course, uh, I think it's quite well known, the situation on the Aegean Islands, how horrific um, everything that Nadia's um, really amazingly outlined for us tonight. Um, but on the mainland, unfortunately, it's it's no better. So, um, of course, uh, there's fewer arrivals um, and, uh, you know, the images have left the media of, of people arriving as they were in 2015. But actually, um, although there's fewer arrivals, because the routes for people to move on and leave Greece are closed, uh, there's actually more people seeking asylum uh, than there were in 2015. So from 2015 to 2018, there was actually a 400% increase in asylum applications in Greece because wow. people simply couldn't uh, move on. Um, so the Greek Asylum Service, um, which only officially started its operations in 2013, um, is seriously overburdened and uh, very dysfunctional. So, um, I mean, just to give an example, um, close to the Brexit deadline in December, uh, one of the Greek Asylum Service offices, uh, they changed premises and they didn't have a phone line or um, proper access to, to the Dublin net system. So just when you really needed to contact people and make sure uh, requests were being sent, it was impossible to communicate with them. Um, in general, in Greece on the ground, there's no uh, state legal aid, so people navigate the asylum procedures at first instance and including family reunification 
uh, alone usually. Uh, there's a limited number of NGOs with limited capacity. Uh, what happens in reality is that the Greek Asylum Service staff communicate with applicants directly, uh, sometimes with interpreters, sometimes with the wrong interpreters, sometimes with no interpreters, sometimes on WhatsApp. Uh, I mean, what happens a lot is that, um, for example, decisions are communicated informally and without enough time to respond uh, in order to, for example, apply for a reconsideration request in time. Um, there are huge delays to actually claim asylum. So although people are physically trapped in Greece, um, they struggle to register claims for asylum if they arrive uh, over the land border at Evros, so from Turkey to Greece. Uh, if people don't arrive via the islands uh, and they arrive direct to mainland Greece, um, it's very common to meet people in Athens where I'm based, who are completely undocumented and they've been in Greece for maybe many, many months. And there's literally just uh, no way to effectively lodge their claim for asylum. The, the way officially to claim asylum is via Skype. So there's different um, Skype lines for different languages and a timetable for allotted uh, periods of time you call at your specific language time. But uh, the Greek Asylum Service uh, once admitted there was only two people answering those Skype lines. So as you can imagine, uh, people's calls usually go unanswered. So it basically leaves people really uh, vulnerable to detention, uh, unable to like move on, progress their claims and their futures. Um, and of course, they, nobody can apply for family reunification if they haven't actually claimed asylum in terms of the Dublin procedure. So I've, I've been working alongside people who have uh, very strong, straightforward Dublin family reunification claims. Uh, but for example, because of lack of interpretation or uh, a particular office being very busy, they're given a time to return maybe in a year. Um, so they're left completely undocumented. Um, uh, I wrote also about on the slide about bureaucratic hurdles. Um, for example, one of the asylum offices in Athens insists that you can't claim asylum unless you have official proof of address. But of course, if you're undocumented, you're going to really struggle to have any kind of official proof of address. You can't legally sign a house contract if you're undocumented. So it's incredibly difficult to even get to the stage where you can apply for Dublin family reunification even before Brexit, unfortunately. Um, and the next slide, please, Effie. Uh, yeah, so it's not just in the UK that there's a hostile environment. There's, uh, uh, I would say, well, let's say very right wing uh, <laughs> government currently in power, the New, New Democracy Party in Greece. Um, they uh, have changed the law over the course of their uh, reign in power so far. Uh, for example, things like um, it, it used to be legal to work once you claimed asylum, but they said that for the first six months after lodging your claim, you weren't eligible to work, which is quite cruel considering there's limited employment opportunities anyway. Um, when people get decisions, um, they are expected to uh, leave their accommodation if they have any, if they're in an official camp or UNHCR accommodation, they have 30 days to leave, similar to the UK, but of course in Greece uh, it's very difficult to transition from um, uh, like into mainstream welfare benefits. There's very, very limited state support and huge barriers to access it and the uh, European funded integration programs are not fit for purpose, basically. Um, so uh, people's cash support is also cut immediately when they get a decision. Uh, when I say cash support, it's similar to an Aspen card known as a cash card in Greece. Uh, it's uh, the program was um, implemented by UNHCR, but it's now being handed over to the ministry, to the Greek government. Um, similar rates also to asylum support in the UK. But the difference is that people are expected to pay their rent from this 150 euros a month, as well as their food and other essential living costs. Um, so uh, in terms of accommodation, it's that there's not a system similar to the NAS accommodation in the UK. Um, 
the only accommodation uh, officially is in camps where there's no clear referral pathway into into camps um, or a UNAR run accommodation program but you must have evidence of a specific vulnerability in order to be referred and you might never hear back even if you are referred so um, in general homelessness or people living in really inadequate overcrowded private accommodation uh, is the norm unfortunately and um, uh, the first thing that the Greek government are, have announced when they're in control of the cash card program is that from next month if you're in private accommodation you're not eligible for this cash card uh, which obviously the people in private rented accommodation or homeless need that card the most uh, but yeah we're going to face a lot more challenges from next month. Um, in terms of unaccompanied asylum seeking children, there's no functioning state social services really for uh, unaccompanied homeless minors. So um, there's what's known as protective custody, which is essentially where minors are imprisoned in police stations before being transferred to detention centres. Um, the, it was recently announced that this protective custody regime should end and that the time uh, unaccompanied minors should be kept in prison. It should be uh, much more limited, but unfortunately, on the ground in practice, um, detention of children is still routine. Um, there is a hugely inadequate number of shelter places, uh, less than half um, of minors in Greece, there's space for them. Um, and they're in the recent reports by the government uh, service responsible for children themselves, they said themselves that over a thousand oh, children wow. were missing, they had no idea where they were. Um, and uh, children are not eligible for this cash card also. So they're really, really um, left without support and facing uh, terrifying conditions. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, in terms of COVID-19, which everyone's sick of thinking about, I'm sure, um, but just briefly, um, the Greek Asylum Service offices are partially closed. So it just means that there's a lot of confusion. Obviously, they uh, want to limit their services so as to avoid people coming to the offices. But because everything's so unclear, I think people probably come more. Um, they announce weekly what they will do, what they won't do. Uh, Inter asylum interviews are routinely cancelled, but there's no real logic to the ones that go ahead. Um, everyone's asylum applicant cards or even ID cards for the recognised people um, have expired um, and the ministry announces that they're automatically renewed. But of course, nobody can travel and face they fa people face a lot of hurdles in day to day life with expired documents. Um, in terms of family reunification, of course, um, Many, many uh, flights for transfers were cancelled, uh, as were flights in general, I suppose. So, yeah, basically the uh, travel restrictions um, and cancelled flights caused big problems for Dublin family reunification. Um, the next slide, please, Effie. So, as Rebecca mentioned, when we talk about transitional cases, it's the cases uh, people who managed to request the UK to take charge of their claim for asylum before the Brexit um, transition period ended. So basically anyone who managed to get their TCR sent before the 31st of December um, last year. And I just noticed in the Q&A, someone from Bat Murphy was asking whether the uh, Home Office exercised, exercised discretion and considered a TCR sent after. But my understanding is that it's not actually been possible to send a TCR after this date. So the UK literally doesn't have access to the Dublin Net system anymore, which is the system that uh, take charge requests were sent using. So, um, yeah, transitional cases. Um, sorry, was there a slide before? Sorry, Effie. No, there wasn't. OK, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to start with the good news before the bad news. Uh, but OK, so for those whose TCRs were sent before um, the Brexit deadline, um, if, if the Home Office um, 
refused to accept responsibility and re uh, refused to reunite them with their family. Of course, if you're in Greece and there's no legal aid, or even if you do have a, uh, a lawyer from an NGO, it's going to be incredibly unlikely that you understand you there's a legal remedy, judicial review in the UK courts. So Pete, there's a huge lack of information, basically. Uh, people really uh, didn't know how to go about challenging any refusal. Um, and even if people did manage to get through to a specialist organisation such as um, RLS, uh, it's still really hard work to handle these cases. Like So even with a legal rep secured in the UK to uh, take forward um, JR proceedings, you really do need someone on the ground in Greece also to support the person and to take things forward. Um, thanks, Effie. Um, so for um, people who, for whom the TCR was sent before the Brexit deadline um, and the Home Office accepted, um, as we mentioned before, because of Corona, there have been delays for everyone's transfers. As well as Corona, there was also bureaucratic issues. Uh, the, the main one was that the contract that the Greek Asylum Service had with the travel agency expired and it took them weeks to renew a contract so they literally couldn't book any flights for anyone. There's no real logic in terms of who's prioritised for transfer. Um, we, For example, we have an unaccompanied asylum seeking child who's waited over 10 months now, but adult clients who are transferred within the six month deadline. Um, it seems to be that they don't want uh, more of a backlog of missed uh, deadlines, so they prioritise the new cases as opposed to the people that are already waiting. Um, there have been advocacy and legal efforts to pressure the Home Office, but at the moment there's a, just a generalised problem and no legal remedy. Um, there's also a lot of confusion on the ground amongst uh, in the legal community and in the Greek Asylum Service in terms of the six month deadline for transfer. So um, the Dublin regulation obviously specified that um, if uh, responsibility was accepted, uh, Greece should affect the person's transfer within six months. Um, but uh, now that the UK is no longer a signatory to the Dublin regulation, this six month deadline doesn't apply. So it means that even if someone isn't transferred within the six months, uh, responsibility doesn't lapse back to Greece. Um, there's also a kind of practical problem in terms of the corona tests that are needed before actually taking a plane to the UK to be reunited with family not just to the UK, but in general, family reunification transfers, um, that people need to take PCR tests before being able to, to board the plane. Uh, tickets are communicated to people very last minute and the instructions to get specific tests done in a specific time frame. It's really stressful and obviously very expensive for people to manage in order to be able to get on the plane to their family. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Um, I don't know if my connection was okay. I hope you could hear me. Um, yeah. All good. Thank you very much, Lucy. That was great. And we could hear you. So uh, I'm going to hand over now to both Harry Harris and to Effie Stathopoulou, who together are running the Family Reunion from Europe project, which RLS set up um, specifically really to, to see, to fill the gap um, following the end of Dublin 3 regulation. So I will leave it to them uh, to very ably tell you what it's all about. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Harry. Um, I'll just be introducing the project um, first. So the FRFE project um, was set up as we've heard to provide legal advice and assistance to kind of fill this vacuum that was caused by Brexit and by the end of Dublin. And so we represent displaced people in Europe who are uh, undocumented, asylum seekers, recognised refugees, and who wish to join their family members. Um, Effie will talk briefly in a bit about the main differences between Dublin and using the entry clearance procedures. But the main and crucial difference at the start of the year um, was a lack of knowledge, a lack of experience, and also a real lack of information, both for, for people who are seeking to reunite with their family and also for organisations here in Greece. 
uh, where I am. Um, and the FRFE project uses pro bono capacity from law firms based in the UK to collect and collate evidence, meet with clients, draft ECF applications, prepare referral bundles when ECF is in place, and then try and place the client with a legal aid solicitor in the UK. So if you're a legal aid solicitor specialising in immigration watching this, please feel free to get in touch um, with, with you know, your, your availability for some cases. Um, and in terms of what we've been seeing, so the cases we work on um, with the FRFE project involve obviously a sponsor in the UK and applicants in, in Greece, France, Germany and across Europe. Uh, most of the applicants have been a mixture of those who have been unable to register as an asylum seeker in Greece. So for all of the reasons um, that Lucy and Nadia set out and for our project, that's predominantly unaccompanied minors, uh, unaccompanied asylum seeking children from, from Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, we also have clients who are currently asylum seekers in Greece um, and people who've had their claim rejected at the second instance and who are therefore either trying to register for a fresh claim or who are at risk of removal. Um, and the biggest difference primarily from Dublin um, is that you don't need to be registered as an asylum seeker in order to apply for entry clearance for family reunion. So we can, in fact, help people who are unregistered, which is which is quite a big change. Um, we have seen some trends emerging with regards to the status of family members in these cases for the sponsors. Um, in the majority of cases with separated families, so um, two parents, children, where one of the parent and perhaps one of the children is in the UK and the rest of the children and other parent are in a European country, and um, the sponsors are all asylum seekers. Um, so, for example, we have six families who are all Kuwaiti Badun, and they've had their asylum claims rejected in multiple European countries. And now one parent and perhaps one child has made it to the UK and is seeking asylum there. And then for the unaccompanied minors, the sponsors tend to have settled status, British citizenship, um, or in some cases where they're joining siblings and the siblings might have refugee status. So this in turn means initially around half of our applications for entry clearance are outside the rules and um, based on the immigration status of the UK sponsor as an asylum seeker. And then the cases that involve unaccompanied minors um, joining uncles and aunts in the UK, um, perhaps they also don't meet the requirements for maintenance and accommodation. So arguments are based very heavily around Article 8 rights in the best interests of the child. Um, we also have cases of adult children trying to join parents in the UK and also of parents trying to join children who were able to make it to the UK um, through the Dublin procedure. So I'm going to talk just briefly about some of the challenges and the difficulties that we've been facing um, with the FRFE project in terms of really quite practical things to do with the situation in Greece um, and in Europe more generally. So for the ECF stage, for example, um, evidencing you know, a negative or unstable income can be very difficult. Um, as Lucy mentioned, the UNHCR cash card, um, providing evidence of this can be really hard because people often apply through apps like Viber, there's no paperwork that you can use to directly evidence the, the cash card a lot of the time. Um, so often we have to rely on things like an ATM receipt or an image of the card um, and a signed statement from the client, you know, evidencing how much they are paid every month. But the payments are often sporadic. They might stop working. They might come late. It's very hard to show regular income of any kind. Um, and also going to an ATM to get a receipt is not always easy, especially at the moment or earlier this year when the COVID restrictions were, were incredibly um, restrictive and there are a lot of police on the streets of Athens. Many people felt quite afraid to leave their houses and do things like print a statement and sign it or go to an ATM and, and take out you know, a receipt. These things aren't necessarily always easy for people who are in Greece. Um, Another issue is the informal housing setups in Athens. So this is particularly relevant for people who are undocumented. So perhaps for people like Lucy mentioned, who've been trying for you know, months and months and months to call on Skype, but who have not been able to register. Um, and in these cases, people are often unable to rent directly. So they are renting rooms by paying a friend or paying a friend of a friend, um, and this person will then pay a landlord. And it can be really difficult to evidence this type of payment because you know, the housing structures are maybe built on more informal connections. And then the reason, the evidence we need for the LAA would be a written statement from the person who's receiving the money or paying it to the landlord. And there's many reasons why someone wouldn't want to sign a statement for the LAA, you know, evidencing that they're receiving rent on behalf of a client. So that can be quite difficult. Um, and then just quickly, you know, at the intersection of these issues, um, again, as briefly covered by Lucy earlier, we are facing the potential end of the cash card for people renting privately. Um, and yeah, I don't think we can really overstate how catastrophic this, this will be for people who have found a place to live and rent and who are trying to make it work with the money they receive um, and who are now facing the end to that income support and, and therefore an end to their housing. Um, 
At the evidence gathering stage, um, as Rebecca discussed earlier, the evidence in these cases is, is incredibly crucial, particularly when trying to deal with applications outside the rules, demonstrating the familial contact and connection, as well as the best interests of the child, um, is incredibly important. Um, and also, given that so many of our cases are outside the rules, we're trying to demonstrate the exceptional circumstances, which would mean that the refusal would either result in, in unjustifiably harsher consequences or um, which constitute compelling, compassionate grounds. So from, from personal experience, working in Athens, but also through talking to clients on this project, um, it's also really clear that um, many of the organizations in Athens are really at capacity. You know, as Lucy mentioned earlier, that there is such a large number of people who need help in, in Athens and in Greece more broadly, that it's very difficult to ask organizations who are referring clients to us to assist with providing documents or reports or medical notes and things like that. Uh, and this extends to trying to find reports from social workers or best interest assessments for children um, in these cases. We're finding it increasingly difficult to, to locate people who would be able to carry out that kind of work for us. And it's really crucial work to these applications where there's often you know, very little documentary evidence of a family link. Um, and that's particularly relevant with regards to um, the clients that we have who are um, Kuwaiti Badun, who have not been able to obviously in Kuwait access certain identity documents that would be particularly helpful for evidencing marriage or for evidencing um, birth certificates, death certificates, things like that. So we're again trying to deal with collecting any forms of evidence we can in, in really quite difficult situations of clients who perhaps don't speak the language of the country they're in or who aren't literate, um, all of which makes it more complicated to gather this evidence. Um, and then finally, just another evidence gathering point for, for unaccompanied asylum seeking children who often don't have any ID documents or who are not old enough to request or hold travel documents from, from their countries of origin or habitual residence. Um, the financial support that they receive from family members is, is really crucial to evidencing their family relationship. And for almost all of the clients who are unaccompanied minors, they're receiving this financial support because someone else their family member is sending it to someone else, a named third party. This person will pick it up at, at Western Union for a fee, and then they'll take it out as cash and give it back to the client. And that's just an additional difficulty to evidence that we have to try and ask the person who's picking up the money to make a statement, because it's obviously very important to show this financial support. It's, it's really good evidence of a family connection, um, but it's often just complicated by the fact that people don't have the documents to pick up money themselves. So. Um, and then finally, just a few of the broader issues or more structural problems. Um, obviously, as again, both Lucy and Nadia mentioned, it's very difficult sometimes for asylum seekers to access medical treatment, medical facilities about assistance or accompaniments, which makes it much harder to produce re relevant evidence in support of an application. Um, and in terms of the provision of incorrect legal advice, we've had reports from clients that they've, they've received really quite incorrect legal advice. We have a, um, clients in France, for example, who um, she's a, a Kuwaiti Badoon mother of four, and she went to um, try and request a, a family reunion under Dublin in early December, in the first week of December. And she was told by the French authorities that um, the window had already closed and that because Brexit had happened, um, she could not apply through Dublin. And so she withdrew her asylum claim based on this poor legal advice. And then in January, went back um, to apply for asylum again, tried again, and was this time, albeit correctly, told that she couldn't apply through Dublin, not given any information about the other possibilities through, through entry clearance applications. So, um, and again, you know, going back to something Lucy said earlier about people who, um, answering the question about people who, you know, their take charge request maybe wasn't sent or there was a mistake. And we also have clients who thought that legal organizations in Greece had submitted the take charge request, found out in January they hadn't, and is now having to go through the entry clearance procedure because um, this opportunity was lost. Um, and now handing over to Effie, there's also um, a large amount of confusion for clients regarding now what they have to see as two dual proceedings. So the asylum claim in the country they're in, and then the entry clearance application to come to the UK. And Effie will, will respond on that. So, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Um, it has already been discussed and explained very well that until the end of 2020, the primary route to family reunion, asylum seekers in the UK, Norway, Switzerland, Liechtenstein would pursue was under the Dublin regulations, even though the Dublin regulations are not a family reunion instrument, as um, I'm sure you all know. Though flawed in many ways in its application, the Dublin scheme was designed for asylum seekers and refugees 
And we tend to forget that the immigration rules are not designed for applicants that are seeking asylum and are displaced. Um, therefore, this the, the Dublin scheme had less stringent evidential requirements than the UK immigration rules, and asylum seekers could be sponsors, as uh, was mentioned already, and special guarantees were afforded for unaccompanied minors joining parents and siblings, irrespective of their status, um, of their immigration status or their accommodation status, while they could also join relatives provided it was their, in their best interest. So this whole best interest assessment was much more streamlined and um, outlined in the Dublin scheme. So it's well known how complex asylum procedures are everywhere, right? And the amount of energy an asylum application takes for the applicants and their advisors and their, like, their families and the people who are with them. So with Dublin, people had the opportunity to quote unquote, freeze their asylum claim examination in the country they applied. And they could wait for the determination of which member state was responsible to take charge of their asylum claims. So this freezing effect was indeed very beneficial for people as it made their decisions much easier and straightforward. They had one problem to deal with at a time. They had, not, they had to go through one process which would or would not lead them to reunion. They would get one decision, um, it would all be light or much lighter touch. So the Dublin regulations, as you've heard and you know already, ceased to apply in the UK uh, in the end of December 2020. So the people who are affected by this in real life were not properly informed of their options, as most resources were in English or in an accessible format. And what really happened, based on multiple testimonies from our clients, is that they were just told by their respective asylum, uh, respective asylum services in their country of residence that they can no longer apply for family reunification. Um, this led, that led to misinformation and panic. And let's not forget that misinformation and panic urges people to make rash decisions and embark on perilous journeys or as Harry mentioned before some people withdrew their protection claims um, which can lead them which can result to destitution, destitution in the country they're living in because in many countries like France or Greece um, benefits are very much linked to the immigration status um, so as Harry mentioned this example of to equate it between families of five and seven. So it's a, a lot of people were affected by this. And when I say affected, not only did their applications, uh, were their applications delayed, but they were on the streets of France and Greece. So a number of our clients, almost everyone, is finding the requirements of the law and the steps needed to be very complicated and hard to meet, despite our efforts to break down the information and make it as accessible as possible. And the fact that they have to deal with two distinct procedures, which are not entirely roadmapped and timeline, makes it very hard to follow. The confusion leads, as I said, to some of them no longer wanting to pursue an entry clearance application and resorting to alternatives uh, that are less safe and non-compliant to the applicable rules. So, so to il illustrate this confusion, we have an example of the procedure a family has to go through prior had to go through prior to the end of the 2020, compared to the steps they'd have to follow in order to reunite post Brexit. So, Lila, a client of ours, she's a mother of four children in Athens, and she's seeking to be reunited with her husband, who's a refugee in the UK. Before Brexit, she could have made a free straightforward application to join him um, with free legal help from our lawyers in Greece, um, from our lawyers in our Athens clinic. And all that through the Greek asylum ser service, although we discussed like many obstacles, but still one route, one building, one service. And um, now it's 
she has to deal with the UK authorities, find a lawyer in the UK to advise her on her options. Um, she might need to provide DNA evidence for all of her children, which is very costly. Find an appointment at the Athens VAC, uh, which can, can be like five or ten uh, weeks ahead and cost five, uh, 50, sorry, 50 pounds for each applicant. So it's 250 in total. There are some free appointments that are scarce or not possible to find at all. Um, it could be, I don't know, in seven months. So it all defeats the purpose. And she'd have to pay for official translations of documents that are needed for the application. And in case her application, in the fortunate event that her application is successful, she'll have to pay for her and her children's tickets to the UK. And in the days of COVID, obviously, she'll have to pay for a PCR tests for her and her children. So all what I mentioned now is sums up to £4,000. And we're talking about people who have who rely on benefits and asylum support. And as Lucy mentioned earlier, it's very, very little and it will stop for many people. So this is an example of a case that doesn't attract a fee. The costs are exponentially higher if we talk about fee-paying applications, such as the adult dependent relative under the Appendix FM, or other applications involving unaccompanied minors and sponsored with ILR or British citizenship. Coordinating um, communication among parties is also very challenging. Communicating the different procedures and managing the expectations both of the clients and their lawyers in Greece, France, in Germany, or whatever in, um, in Europe is becoming increasingly complex and some, as some valid legal questions are being raised uh, because no one was really using that route before. The lawyers and their other advisors in Greece and France are the first ones who to encounter cases of family reunion to the UK as they have direct contact with the applicants. And because the, the advisors are not well informed about the options to apply for family reunion under the immigration rules, people are not always, don't always get the right information. They're scared, they're discouraged, they are, yeah, discouraged completely. Um, and apart from the confusion caused by, caused by the process itself, clients are, as well as their legal representatives, um, have valid legal questions relating to the status of the applicants in case they apply for entry clearance to the UK. Uh, we might say that it's something very easy to research about, but when it comes to practical when it comes to the reality, these questions become much more challenging. Such questions are, asylum seekers cannot travel outside the country they've applied for asylum. So what happens to a pending asylum claim in Greece when the applicant is granted entry clearance to the UK? What happens to one's refugee status in Greece or France if they are granted entry clearance to the UK? These are legal questions that I'm sure you can all answer if you research, but these are questions that come up every day and people require answers. Is the state mechanism in the UK ready to accept transfer refugee status application and decide them in due course and process them in due course? Are there any assurances in place to ensure that these issues will be resolved and discussed and be made accessible for people? What happens with applicants who haven't been able to apply for asylum? It's what Harry said um, is right, that people who are not registered asylum seekers can still apply, but they have valid doubts about presenting themselves to the authorities if they haven't got any legal documents in the country of residence, um, whether that's Greece or France or another European country. Um, and let's not forget that the UK government statement on legal routes for protection claimants from the EU of, of the 8th of February, in conjunction with a new plan for immigration recently introduced for public consultation, do not seem to propose any viable solution or answer any of those questions. 
while the Home Office claims in its correspondence with failed Dublin three applicants and in other public statements that the UK immigration rules provide the same possibilities for a family reunion, our statistics say the complete opposite. As you can see here in the charts, more than 85% of our cases would be eligible under the mandatory clauses of the Dublin regulations, whereas only 14.6% of our cases are, of our clients are eligible under the immigration rules for family reunion. And I mean, I'll leave it here to reflect a bit um, and Harry will pick up and give you a bit more information about other legal issues. Yeah, just, just a final point, because I'm aware we have questions and we are running out of time. Um, just to raise that the, the fee waiver application issue at the moment um, is, is something that's causing a lot of uh, distress and confusion for sponsors in the UK. And this is most relevant for unaccompanied minors um, who are a significant number of our clients joining aunts and uncles under paragraph 297 of the immigration rules. And the prospect of a fee paying application, even with a very thorough explanation of the fee waiver application process is understandably quite concerning and troubling for sponsors. And we've had several cases of sponsors dropping out of the process um, following requests for, for bank statements or for detailed breakdowns of income and things like that. Um, and also, I mean, as, as legal practitioners, the current lack of guidance for fee waiver applications at the moment is is, is difficult and concerning. Um, RLS submitted an FOI regarding the processing of these applications in this interim period before the, the new guidance comes out. And the response was just that while you know applicants are entitled to apply for a discretionary fee waiver, um, an application will only be considered if it's urgent and non-urgent applications will be placed, placed on hold pending the publication of the, review, the revised guidance. Um, and there was no explanation you know, from that FOI about urgency. So for example, some of our clients are clearly urgent cases in terms of their, the timing. So perhaps they're 17 year olds who are turning 18 in a few weeks. But I mean, in other cases, they're, they're urgent just because they involve children living in unstable temporary accommodation with adults and, and no cash in assistance, no social support and no care. Um, we also are concerned about the status of the asylum seeker sponsor. So as we've mentioned many times, most of our sponsors for, for these separated families are asylum seekers in the UK. Um, and although the majority of their claims are very strong, the underlying claims, there's still a big element of uncertainty surrounding the, the status of this family member joining outside the rules um, to meet them. If they're dependent on the asylum seeker status of the sponsor, and then if that application is rejected, the asylum application of the sponsor, it just adds another layer of, of precarity and uncertainty for families who've often faced you know, years of, of fighting to be recognized as asylum seekers or, or fighting to reunite. And so finally, from, from the work that Effie and I have been doing, um, it's really clear that this process is also just quite psychologically distressing for, for clients and for families. Um, many of the children of these separated families are, are seeking treatment for stress related to physical and mental health problems. And the uncertainty around applying outside the rules, which in itself is, is something which sounds relatively difficult or, or um, uncertain for clients, uh, let alone the delay on top of you know, the delay of the asylum application, the delay of perhaps not being able to submit your TCR application under Dublin, and now more delay of, of doing this application. And then just the re-traumatization of, of repeating all this information all over again to a new set of legal practitioners um, all of this is, is contributing to a situation where the family is really forced to deal with multiple complex legal proceedings at once, just in order to try and be um, reunited. Um, so I think now we'll hand back over to Rebecca, who's going to host uh, the brief Q&A. Um, thanks. Thank you very much, Harry and Effie. Um, I also wanted to thank the commercial law firms, without whom we couldn't actually run the FRFE. Uh, currently, uh, they are Oric, Ashurst, Reed Smith, Allen and Overy and White Case. And tomorrow, in fact, we are training Simmons and Simmons, who have also um, are going to be offering their pro bono services. So thank you to them as well. So in terms of the Q&A, I think they are all now in the Q&A. A few snuck into the chat. Um, hello, Antonia. I'm sorry, I can't see you. So in terms of your question, the first one. Uh, does the ban on children seeking to bring in family apply to former children with refugee status granted when they were children or as young adults? I mean, the answer to that is effectively yes, in the sense there is no immigration rule. 
So if, if you recall from the slides, it's only your spouse, partner, or a minor child that will fit neatly under the rules. However, there is absolutely nothing to stop you making an Article 8 application outside the rules. Does anyone want to add anything to that? The next question is interesting, the one from Bat Murphy, which is, have we seen the Home Office exercise discretion to consider a TCR that was effectively submitted late? Um, I have a feeling we did have a case, but I can't remember what happened to it. So I'm going to now turn to the team, possibly Lucy, to see if we've had any. And I, I suspect we may have just, it was too late and we just had to do it as an outside the rules application. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I mentioned briefly in um, just when I spoke earlier, um, but maybe it got lost in all of the incredibly horrible to hear information. Um, yeah, it's not physically possible for the Greek asylum service caseworkers to send a TCR to the uh, European intake unit anymore because um, the EIU just doesn't have access to Dublin net anymore. So over um, in this really awful Christmas period when the computers were down and the phone lines were down and the Greek asylum service uh, were experiencing technical difficulties. They were sending just emails to the European Intake Unit, but things were getting really badly lost. And that's not the way TCRs are obviously supposed to be sent and received. So since Brexit, as I understand it, it's not actually physically possible to even send um, a TCR. Um, so anyone that we do encounter um, after um, basically from this year onwards, we have to try our best to see if there's an application to make, usually outside the rules with the FRFE project. And it's worth saying that the FRFE project is basically the only one of its kind, really, because there are other organisations obviously doing amazing work, but mainly focusing on ch unaccompanied children only. So when adult uh, potential applicants pop up who under Dublin would have had um, you know a TCR sent for them it's really one of the only options unfortunately yes the only the only time that I've seen the exercise of discretion is in transitional cases which are already a judicial review so they they did in fact predate uh, so, for example, say we got DNA, um, it was rejected, but in the JR, the Home Office then changed their mind and exercised discretion. But those were already ongoing cases, if that makes sense. Um, so there's a question from Joe Mandava uh, to me, whether it's possible to use family reunion case law to make an application outside the rules to demonstrate the best interests of a child where a sponsor is a naturalised British citizen and former refugee. Um, um, it's not clear, presumably the child is external, the sponsor is a former refugee, now British. So I think whenever there are, there are children, you're possibly going to have a better prospect of success just because, as you know, the, the case law and Section 55 mean you've just got more robust law to rely on. Uh, there's a question from Wendy Pettifer about the funding situation. Um, this is quite interesting, and I think I'm, I'm again going to hand this back to the, to the Athens team. Basically, we have had to Register, try and register ourselves as a charity in Greece in order to operate there. Um, so when we are a charity in the UK, but more generally, I think possibly Harry and Lucy may be able to comment on that, Wendy. Do you want to, Harry? Go ahead. To I'll chip in. Uh, so this is a uh, part of the hostile environment basically created by the new democracy government. So they have specifically focused their attention to um, 
NGOs working with refugees in general, there's quite a lot of, uh, <laughs> could I, you could say contempt for NGOs and there's lots of kind of conspiracy theories in terms of they're complicit with Turkey uh, and they're kind of supporting uh, so-called illegal immigration, this kind of thing. Um, so the there were it was announced by the new democracy government that any organisation working with refugees uh, had to apply um, to go on a special register, um, and it's essentially very bureaucratic, dysfunctional, and corrupt. So um, it's basically just caused a lot of, especially small organisations, a lot of stress to try and jump through the bureaucratic hoops that are designed basically to just stop you functioning. Um, so in terms of uh, foreign funding, that's not so much the issue, um, but it's, I mean, I, I'm lucky enough not to deal with it. Uh, we've got a colleague who's really good at that kind of thing, but I just understand it's a total nightmare. Um, so yeah, not so much about uh, where the funding comes from, but just a general kind of uh, clamp down on organizations working with refugees and especially like, also, I, uh, perhaps a lot of people are familiar with the criminalisation of um, organisations working with refugees, like especially on the islands, uh, and especially focused on rescue or um, yeah, safety at sea kind of thing. Um, yeah, don't want to go too off topic. But just to add also really quickly, it has it has a really direct impact on the things that we've all been discussing tonight, which is misinformation. And um, for example, you know, if, if you're in the camps and there's a list of, of NGOs who are allowed to register and, you know, non-registered NGOs are not permitted to register, it just reduces the number of people who can enter the camps and provide legal advice and information. And if you don't know that you can make an application for entry clearance because no one's been able to reach you and tell you, it's very unlikely that someone in Greece, you know, um, not... Um, someone within the camp, for example, would, would be able to give that kind of information and guidance. So it does have a massive knock on effect, the, the policing of NGOs in this way. Thank you very much, both. Uh, there are two questions, well, one a question and one a comment from Tarek Nawaz. Um, thank you for the comment, Tarek. Uh, Tarek, that, that is that family reunion applicants are now given three months, effectively 90 days, rather than 30 to travel to the UK. So that's clearly a, a, an improvement. Um, in relation to Turkey being highlighted as an unsafe third country, it's not in any of the UK country guidance, but Lucy has in the chat posted a very helpful report about issues relating to Turkey. So if you want to go to the chat, hopefully you can copy uh, and paste that. Um, in general, there are lots of um, uh, human rights organisations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, that have um, documented uh, reform and uh, like human rights abuses in Turkey in general. So it's something I guess we're going to focus energies on here in Greece strategically more and more. But um, yeah, it's there's lots of evidence to draw from. Uh, but the thing I posted in the chat particularly significant because it's the European Asylum Support Office themselves saying that Turkey isn't um, isn't particularly safe but um, yeah thank you for that Lucy um, there there's an interesting question from Antonia again about consideration of the emotional and financial capacity of a family member to look after a child relative when making the family reunion application. I'm going to pass that to Harry and Effie to answer because you, I know you've both been having um, close contact with, with sponsors. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, it's, it's a really crucial, crucial consideration. So financially, it's something we have to consider in terms of the maintenance and accommodation for, for a child sponsor, for a, sorry, a child joining a relative who is settled in the UK, for example. But also, we've just had a lot of experience with sponsors who, it becomes very clear when a sponsor does have the emotional connection to a child. And um, you can see it through the messages. We gather all kinds of evidence about, you know, what they talk about and what they're in contact about and the amount of financial support they're giving and the amount they know about the child in question. Um, and it 
becomes very clear that if a sponsor is not really dedicated to bringing a child that they love to the UK to live with them, they, they will drop out of the process. It's, it's incredibly taxing for sponsors to provide this level of, of information, of, of personal um, witness statements, of you know, information about their, their income and their housing and their family. It's very personal stuff. Um, and, and if a sponsor doesn't have this kind of you know, emotional financial capacity, it's my experience that they drop out. They, they don't continue with it. But I mean, Effie, if, if you have anything to add to that, please do. No, I... I would um, only like to say that for some people it becomes their only, yeah, they're all, the only thing they're doing for the period that they're talking with us. They're constantly on their phone. They're constantly trying to find evidence. And so it's very emotionally yeah, draining. And I think this procedure shows that the family relationship is so stereotypically outlined in the immigration rules that only a certain kind of relationship and a certain kind of closeness is acceptable. And we are advocating for, you know, making the family members um, definition as wide as possible. And yeah, I think we all think that it's very unfair that the sponsors have to commit all this, uh, like engage so much of their time at this very initial stage and so intensively. So of course they have to be engaged and committed, but sometimes it, we are asking too much from them. Some, some of them are like older or they don't have computers. They can't send photos. They can't, sign papers they can't they don't have a bank app to access their bank statements quickly it's all these things that we need to take into account so yeah i just wanted to say that it's it's also really interesting in comparison to dublin because under dublin obviously it was really good <laughs> for us that um and for people that they could reunite more with less of an evidential burden but for children uh, going to their guardians or their parents or their brothers or their sisters, there was no requirement to show that uh, they could take care of them. So on the one hand, it's really, really good that a child would leave the conditions in Greece. But, and I don't want to, you know, obviously we need to, I don't want to ruin what's seen as the only happy ending of family being reunited. But the reality was that um, a lot of relationships did break down upon arrival in the UK because um, you know, if you're, well, for, for many different kinds of reasons, families are complicated. But I mean, under Dublin, if a child wanted to go to their aunt or their uncle or their grandfather or their grandmother, then you did have to show at least that that relative could take care. But for siblings, you didn't. For parents and siblings and guardians, you didn't. So it was literally just a case of, I mean, not to make it sound so simple, obviously, it was never super easy. But um, you didn't have to show that they that they could be taken care of. So, yeah, it's it's a really interesting question. Thank you all. That's those are really interesting nuanced answers. Um, there are two questions about making applications from Rajitha. Hello, Rajitha, and, and an anonymous person, which um, I think have been answered really by Nina's very helpful response which is to use the refugee family reunion option, um, which means that you don't pay fees or have to apply for a fee exemption. And that, that's worked for her. So it may be you do want to, to just try that rather than go down a more formal application route. Anything you want to add? Again, Harry and Effie probably on that one. Just, just that when we're talking about fee waivers, we're talking about applications where we can't submit them outside the rules, but mirroring the refugee family reunion application. So as Nina's really helpfully said, you know, where the sponsor's a refugee, their, their fee doesn't need to be paid if it's a standard application. And if the sponsor's an asylum seeker, we intend to submit these applications or prepare the applications for legal aid solicitors to, 
to um, submit them as outside the rules, no fee attached. The difficulty is with unaccompanied minors who are joining parent, non-parent, excuse me, relatives such as uncles and aunts, because it's technically within the rules and there is a large fee attached to that application. So that's why we're um, looking at the fee waiver guidance and making applications currently for, for fee waivers for those clients. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, I'm sorry that we have run out of time, but if I can refer you to the last page of the slides that actually has our contact details. So if there are any unanswered questions, and I think Wendy, you, you have um, some queries about a, a young person from Calais, please get in touch and we'll, we'll try and deal with them off screen as it were. So this has been recorded, but also the slides will be sent round so that you will have a physical copy of those. Um, so yes, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to the wonderful RLS team and uh, thank you all for attending. <laughs>